So here's something I've learned over the past however many years. If you're going to put together a book of documents or of thoughts or of anything, put together, put together a book that's the book you need, because then other people will need it. So the other part of that lessons learned is if you're going to have speakers come and speak, have the people come and speak that you really want to hear from and just haven't had the privilege. So that's the key. Now you know, you can, you can do the future conferences. Um, and, and this speaker right now is, is very much an illustration of what I'm talking about. Somebody I've admired from afar for a long time and never had quite the right topic to invite her for. But now I do. And you're going to have the same benefit I do, which is to listen to her. I want to say a few words about Judge Patricia Wald before she starts. Uh, she is... Um, sort of a, a trailblazer in terms of women in the legal profession. She uh, went to law school at Yale Law School. I believe she was one of 11 women, which I think makes Yale very not foresighted at the time. Um, she was the case editor of the Yale Law Journal. She had a federal clerkship with Jerome Frank on the Second Circuit. And then she went on to do many memorable things, some of which I'm going to mention. In 1964, she wrote a book called Bail in the United States, which I think maybe we should return to once again and read. She served many presidents. She served on President Johnson's Commission on Crime. She was the Assistant Attorney General for Legislative Affairs under uh, President Carter. She um, was appointed by President Carter to the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit in 1979. She served on that court for 20 years. And then after retirement, she started a whole new thing, which brings her into our realm. She became a U.S. representative to the International Criminal Tribunal. She was on the President's Commission on Intelligence Capabilities, which most of us refer to as the WMD report about the United States um, poor intelligence um, in the run-up to involvement in the war in Iraq. And she currently serves, importantly for us, as a member of the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. And today she's going to share with us some of her thoughts on this uh, relationship and conversation between security, privacy, and liberty. Judge Wall. Thank you. Well, one thing I think everyone in this room can agree upon is that cyber threats can be a genuine national security issue, and they do rank high on any list of potential national disasters. The president has warned that, quote, the cyber threat to critical infrastructure continues to grow and represents one of the most serious national security challenges we must confront. We don't need to be reminded that a successful cyber strike at an electric grid system or a banking network, be it the work of a terrorist or a 14-year-old hacker, can disable a city or even a country as disastrously as a fleet of bombers. But I think we also agree that the sharing of critical threat information inside the private sector and between the government and the private sector is one of, if not the primary tools of cybersecurity protection. We heard a lot about that from the earlier panel. But in 2013, President Obama issued Executive Order 13636 on improving critical infrastructure cybersecurity aimed at, quote, increasing the volume, timeliness, and quality of cyber threat information shared with US private sector entities. Privacy advocates like Greg Nojim at the Center for Democracy and Technology testifying before Congress acknowledged that the sharing of critical threat information produces greater awareness of cyber threats and responsive defensive measures, accelerates the development of more sensitive threat indicators, allows more rapid notification to potential victims, and enhances the ability to identify and prosecute cyber malfeasors. Yet, if we are to credit public sources, not enough critical information is being shared. And legislative proposals to facilitate a broader regime of information sharing have, at least until last week, had slow going. Despite administration efforts, including assistance to private sector entities, assurances to private sector entities that they will not, absent certain special circumstances, 
be prosecuted under the antitrust laws for sharing threat information with other private entities. But concerns as to what kinds of information can and should be shared legally among private businesses or with the government without fear of civil liabilities, as, wor as well as worries as to how the government will handle the information and what information the government will itself share with private entities have dominated the debate. And so far an element of, I know the word trust uh, bothers some people, but so far an element of trust I haven't been able to figure out a better one, among the principal interests on these issues have not always been notable in the debate. Now the rest of my talk, I want to stress, represents my thoughts alone and in no way reflects those of the PCLOP board on which I serve as a part-time board member. It has not taken an official position on any of these. I told your facilitator that that was so and she said it was all right to come anyway. A lot <laughs> Along with this disclaimer goes a confession because there are so many players in the arena right now, and I to this point am principally an observer, you, I hope, will forgive me if I don't always get every detail of every legislative version straight, but I'm trying. The privacy issues involved in cyber threat information sharing are myriad and complex, but they're critically important to its success, again, as prior panelists have noted. Initially, let me say I believe that PCLOB is a natural choice to play a part in the resolution of some of these issues. Our statutory jurisdiction, as well as our so far limited, we've only been around in our present form eh, for about two and a half years. We came just after Raj. But our limited but relevant experience with oversight of other programs involving the intelligence community and our statutorily insured access to classified as well as unclassified data make us particularly well situated from the job. We all have those awful top secret clearances you heard about. Peak Club is a, for those of you that don't know, and hopefully that's not too many, is a partisan independent agency within the executive department which Congress created following a recommendation of the 9-11 Commission. Its statutory purpose is to, quote, analyze and review actions the executive branch takes to protect the nation from terrorism. We interpret that to mean counterterrorism policies. And to ensure that the need for such actions is balanced with the need to protect privacy and civil liberties and that liberty concerns are appropriately considered in the development and implementation of laws, regulations, and policies related to efforts to protect the nation against terrorism. We are pretty unique in being the only independent, dedicated privacy oversight board with jurisdiction that includes the intelligence communities within our government, and so far as I can tell, in any other country's government as well. Now what independence means in our particular situation is that we don't have to clear with the White House or with anybody else our reports or our inquiries uh, except for declassification purposes. Uh, they don't have to say it's okay or we want you to take this out unless it's on classification purposes. So that gives us, I think, a fairly unique status in that, in that way. Now, PCLOB has two principal statutory functions, advice to and oversight of executive agencies with regard to privacy and civil liberties on the counterterrorism programs, and secondly, keeping the public and Congress informed about what we're doing. Now, so far, PCLOB's participation in cybersecurity has been mainly limited to our, quote, advice function. Pursuant to Executive Order 13636, over the past two years, we have consulted with the relevant government agencies, that's mostly in the intelligence community, on the privacy and civil liberties assessment reports that they are required to compile under that same EO. It is, of course, Congress's prerogative to specify broader future roles in cybersecurity protection for us, and indeed, several of the pending legislative programs would do just that. For example, the administration's legislative proposal, which is largely incorporated in Senator Carper's Cyber Threat Sharing Act, S-456, 
provides that the Attorney General or the Secretary of DHS in consultation with PCLOB, that's us, shall develop and periodically review policies and procedures governing the receipt, retention, use, and disclosure of cyber threat indicators by a federal entity obtained in connection with the activities which are authorized under those acts. The Senate and House Committee Intelligent Bills, which are S754 and HR 1560, would also require PCLOB biannually to submit to Congress and the President a report on, quote, its assessment, that's our assessment, of the effect on privacy and civil liberties by the type of activities carried out under the Act, and an assessment of the sufficiency of the policies, procedures, and guidelines established pursuant to the Act in addressing concerns relating to privacy and civil liberties. Congressman McCall's bill, H.R. 1731, which also passed the House last week, would, among other things, require the Inspector General of DHS, in consultation with PCLOB, to periodically submit a report reviewing the use of cybersecurity risk information shared with the DHS National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center. Congressman Ruppersberger's House Bill, H.R. 234, would require the Chief Civil Rights Officer of DHS, in consultation with PCLOB, to submit an annual report assessing the privacy and civil liberties impact of government information activity, government information sharing activities with respect to cybersecurity, along with recommendations on mitigating any impacts. As the audience is aware, the House passed both the House Intelligence Bill, H.R. 51560, and H.R. 1731, the McCall Bill, last Friday. Now, <clears throat> whichever of those functions, and they're quite similar, but different in some interesting aspects, which I'll get to later, but whatever functions Congress decides to give us, I want to make the point that it's vitally important that our role should be a clearly defined one. We have learned in our two years of operation, sometimes to our consternation, that just telling other agencies to, quote, consult with us does not clarify at what point in the development of privacy policies we are to be consulted, let alone the weight to be given our advice. We have on occasion been given overnight, two days, three days, <laughs> notice on which to consult about uh, 40, 50 page preceding reports, which I don't think is what these bills have in mind, but it may be necessary if they have in mind a more serious consulting role for us, I'm gonna at least to put that in the legislative history. Our own statute, however, our enabling statute does require that we report to Congress whenever an executive agency rejects our advice that a quote proposal should not be implemented, but exactly what constitutes a, quote, proposal in this context can itself be a tricky proposition, which probably fortunately we haven't yet had to confront, but may have to under the, some of the pending legislation. I would like now to identify a few facets of cybersecurity threat protection that I consider to implicate major privacy issues. Even if these issues don't surface in the legislation itself, they're almost certainly going to come up in the rules or guidelines which are mandated by those legislations. The first issue, which has been alluded to before by the panel, is what kind of cyber threat information is critical to warn others and to elicit an effective response from governmental authorities. With respect to current cyber threat information sharing, either between private entities and the government or within the government itself, neither the original Executive Order 13636 nor the original Sharing and Analysis Centers, which have been established to encourage private entity threat sharing, operate under any single generally applied set of restrictions on the content of threat information that's passed along among private concerns or between private concerns and the government. As a result, many private concerns have worried about civil liability for allegedly violating the privacy of other private persons or entities by disclosing PI, personally identifiable information, within the private sector or to government. Advocacy groups as well have shown concern because of the risk that, that PI would be unsuccessfully trans 
would be unnecessarily transmitted either to or and from or among govern, government and private sectors. Now, even as to the transmissions among different government agencies, the EO, the executive order regime, required only that those agencies coordinate their activities under the EO with their privacy and civil liberties officials to ensure that privacy and civil liberties protections were incorporated into their activities. Now, those protections were to be based under the EO upon the fair information practice principles known as the FIPS and, quote, other privacy and civil liberties policies, principles, and frameworks as they apply to each agency's activities. The EO itself did not provide any clearer guidance than that to the agencies requiring whether or when to scrub what kind of cyber threat information of unnecessary private information. The FIPS, as you know, are fairly general precepts which guide all agencies of the government, including the intelligence community, in deciding what information can be shared or disseminated inside or outside the agency. But under the current regime, for instance, a cyber threat signature or other indicia of cyber malfeasance might first be discovered in the private sector and subsequently transmitted to a designated government sector specific agency, say in energy or defense, which in turn would decide whether to pass it on to another investigatory or enforcement agency like DHS, FBI, or CIA. In the absence of more precise directions on deleting unnecessary privacy information along the way, it would seem possible to have different degrees of privacy-related information retained in the data banks of different agencies, not an altogether comforting proposition. But I do point out, however, and I think the panelist in the prior panel did point this out, that some agencies, like DHS, did go ahead and create their own internal policies, procedures, and standards to guide information sharing under the EEO. The recent EEO 13636 Privacy and Civil Liberties Assessment Report released by DHS a few weeks ago contained many of these activity-specific standards for scrubbing cyber threat information of privacy information. However, there were, so far as I could tell, no required or generally applicable standards mandated by the EEO or yet by Congress for the stripping of privacy information from cyber threat indicators that are shared with the government by private entities or in reverse shared by the government with private entities. Now the administration's supplementary EO of February 2015 sought to fill in some of these gaps. It created a, it called on DHS, quote, to encourage the development and formation of information sharing and analysis organizations, ISAOs, ISAOs, to coordinate and share cyber risk and cyber threat information with DHS's own National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center. But this is interesting. Additionally, DHS, in consultation with other federal entities, was required by the order to enter into an agreement with an NGO, unspecified, to identify a common set of voluntary standards or guidelines for the creation and functioning of the ISAOs. The standards were to address business processes, operating procedure, technology, and privacy protections using a best services approach, technology, best services approach, but retaining the same privacy guideposts for agencies as before, namely FIPS and whatever other privacy laws are as they apply to each agency's activities. But as we will now see, Congress has its own set of formulae for cyber threat sharing to which I will turn after noting a few principles that seem important to me. The first is minimally, scrubbing for unnecessary private information should be a major policy, major privacy protection mechanism both in the private sector and in the government. Privacy advocates push for more specific limits on the kind of information about threats that are relayed to, by, and within the government. They point out that it often may not be necessary to transmit any privacy information at all. Some virus signatures, threat signatures, and software flaws may not contain any privacy information and in many cases will be sufficient in themselves to elicit the appropriate threat response or defense. There will, however, be some cases in which that won't be enough. 
the IP address of a sender or even a recipient may be an intrinsic part of the signature thread itself and needs to be conveyed. That is why careful review and scrubbing of unnecessary privacy information as the cyber threat information moves along its prescribed route is so essential. And those who first discover the threat need to be told as clearly as possible what kind of information is necessary and useful to other real or potential victims or to the government. Even so, the especially volatile atmosphere that may surround the transmission between private sources and government of a cyber threat accentuates the risk that irrelevant personal information may be included and find its way initially in the government possession. All of the pending legislative proposals provide in some, but somewhat different ways, that the process of scrubbing threat information of privacy information will take place. The administration's preferred legislative proposal, which is incorporated in Senator Carper's S-456, define a cyber threat indicator as one, quote, from which reasonable efforts have been made to remove information that can be used to identify specific persons reasonably believed to be unrelated to the cyber threat. That definition applies to private entities as well as government agencies in effect adopting a duty to strip at all levels. Government agencies under these bills have an additional duty at every stage of processing to anonymize and safeguard any information that can be used to identify persons unrelated to the threat. The Senate Intelligence Bill would apply a similarly worded duty to scrub information shared with or by the government to a private entity but imposes no more specific requirement than the FIPS plus principles drawn from other civil liberties law when one agency shares threats information with another. The House Intel Bill, which passed the House last week, requires agencies to remove personal information about a person not directly related to a cyber threat from any threat indicators they receive or transmit from private sources. But its focus on sharing between agencies is, and this was also talked about earlier, on real-time transmission to ensure that threat indicators are transmitted automatically if possible and not subject to any modification or delay that could impede real-time receipt by all the appropriate federal entities. The administration noted this conflict, possible conflict, between removing privacy information and real-time sharing when it made its administration piece supporting H.R. 1560. Now, H.R. 234, which is the Rufusberger Bill, requires no stripping by a private entity, but does require government agencies to, quote, limit the receipt, trans retention, use, and disclosure of cyber threat information associated with persons, quote, that is not necessary to protect systems or networks from cyber threats or mitigate cyber threats in a timely manner. Finally, the McCall Bill, which also passed last week, requires the government and private sector entities prior to sharing to take reasonable efforts to remove or exclude information that can be used to identify specific persons and is reasonably believed at the time of sharing to be unrelated to the cybersecurity risk. My own feeling is that while rapid transmission, as one panelist noted, is a very important goal, it should not, in my view, trump completely reasonable efforts to be made at all levels to strip the threat information of unnecessary privacy information. Indeed, the assurance that stripping is going to be done all along the way would, again, in my view, contribute to some alleviation of the trust deficit that many feel is a sine qua non to full-fledged cooperation between the government and the private sector. But just as important as who does the stripping and when is what standard will be used to decide what is deleted and what is kept. The standard for removal most commonly found in the bills is, quote, information that can be used to identify persons reasonably believed to be unrelated to the cyber threat or, in the Senate bill, not directly related to that threat. Now, related to, and its mirror image, unrelated to, encompass a wide swath of informational terrain, which could certainly, in many cases, include or not include privacy information. 
The reasonably believed to be unrelated standard requires, so far as I can tell, the decision maker to reasonably rule out all possible relationships between the person whose privacy information, the person or entity, whose privacy information is at issue, and the cyber threat before deciding to delete it. Apart from the intellectual gymnastics involved, it seems likely, to me at least, that the, this standard permits more privacy information to be collected and transmitted than the simpler standard of information, quote, not necessary to describe or counter the cyber threat, unquote, that many privacy advocates have recommended as a standard for deletion. The standard for purging could make a huge difference in the likelihood of privacy information falling through the stripping net. It's important, too, that the purging decision be required to be made promptly upon receipt by the government agency, although I cannot find that requirement in most of the bills. The administration and Senator Carper's proposals speak only of the, quote, timely destruction of information known not to be directly related to an authorized purpose or use. The Senate and House intelligence bills would, re would require guidelines on the length of time in which cyber threat information can be retained. I want to point out here a little of our experience in PCLOP. In the course of our 702 FISA inquiry, PCLOP found that incidentally collected information concerning U.S. persons who may have unwittingly communicated with foreign targets regularly had those communications retained in agency data banks for several years until they, quote, aged out, which is usually five years or more, even though agency minimization guidelines required purging if they were found clearly to have no foreign intelligence value. But what was happening on the ground was the analysts rarely, if ever, made any findings as to whether or not they had foreign intelligence value on the theory that no one could ever tell when something apparently not of value today might, under the mosaic theory, become of value later. So the default position was invariably to just keep it in. While in the data banks, the information could be accessed and analyzed and even queried by authorized persons using the US person identity as the identity for the search. Now, the question of how great a threat to privacy lies in government acquisition and retention alone surfaces a fundamental schism that resides in the larger intelligence privacy debate that PCLOB has already encountered in its Section 215 and 702 reports. To wit, and this has been referred a little bit, I think, in Raj's remarks, is collection of personal information in and of itself a potential privacy threat, even if the government never misuses or uses that information in any way that hurts the person? Some experts say no, reasoning that adequate controls on its subsequent storage and dissemination are sufficient to protect privacy. Still others, and I'm included, maintain that collection and retention themselves are a privacy intrusion that must be justified by a national security interest. A majority of the PCLAP board maintained that stance in its 215 report on metadata collection of domestic phone calls. But I won't here reprise the brief for the perils of unnecessary collection or retention regardless of later use. I'll do it briefly. It, <laughs> it chills spontaneous disclosures, alters the basic relationship between citizens and government, and as history shows, puts the citizen at risk of hackers as well as future misuse by less benevolent governments than the current one. And people as old as me have lived through many of the less benevolent governments regimes. The private sector also appears to take such concerns seriously. It is striving to create data management systems that will, in the words of one private sector, quote, enable the verification of someone's identity without having to pass along personal information. Until we do that, things are going to get worse. The government stance in contexts other than cybersecurity, I think it's fair to say, has been more flexible on collection and retention than subsequent use or dissemination, as evidenced by the White House's 2014 report on big data, the NSA minimization rules for FISA-related information, although I will say that the President's directive on rights of non-US persons in Signet, Signal Oper Intelligence Operations, PPD 28, 
does limit bulk collection data to a list of several reasonably specific purposes. Still, the government cybersecurity directives do subscribe, as do the FIPS, to the principle of purpose-oriented limits for initial collection. But because in other contexts the government has shown more flexibility as to the retention and use of incidentally information, collected information, not directly related to the collection purpose, I tend to favor mandated review and removal of unnecessary PI material upon receipt at all levels. Now another noteworthy issue in cybersecurity regulation that involves privacy is control of and consistency in the handling of information as it moves through the government. The February 2015 EO gives DHS the authority to set up an information sharing portal through which ISAOs, those are the private entity uh, outfits, and the government may engage in information sharing. But some witnesses before Congress have advocated much stronger controls. For instance, that DHS be not only the sole port of entry for private uh, cyber threats information, but be authorized to decide whether to transmit that threat information further to the FBI, DOD, DOD whomever appeared to be best suited to respond. Furthermore, and this is actually in the order, DHS would be required, no, I'm sorry, it's not, it's in the witness's testimony. DHS would be required to formulate a privacy framework that dealt consistently with cyber information matters such as purging, anonymization, minimization, retention and use throughout the intelligence community. This more detailed privacy framework would presumably replace or supplement agency separate private policies revolving around the FIPS. One of my own PCLOB colleagues, incidentally, has written in a separate op-ed piece that the FIPS were designed for more traditional privacy problems than national security, and they need to be revisited to render them useful for privacy protection of highly sensitive and often classified national security information. Now, many of the current bills do provide for a set of consistent rules on retention and use of PI in threat information, though not DHS control over the transmittal process. But I personally hope that in some fashion, legislation does adopt the privacy policy framework that will make consistent the interagency process for dealing with cyber threat information. Now, the last point I'm going to make is the scope of authorized use and dissemination of privacy information collected as part of a cyber threat is a vital component of any privacy framework. The current EO provides no specifics in this area so that apart from basing privacy protections on the FIPS and these other privacy and civil liberties policies, each agency is presumably free to apply its normal practices in that regard so long as it finds them to be privacy protected. The administration and the CARPER legislative proposals, however, specifically allow for law enforcement use of cyber threat information to investigate, prosecute, disrupt, or otherwise respond to computer crimes, a threat of death or serious bodily harm, a serious threat to a minor including sexual exploitation, threats to physical safety, or a conspiracy to commit any of those offenses. The Senate and House intelligent bills allow the use of the cyber threat information to identify for its um, disclose for its location and for a defense against it, but also for any threat involving the use of an information system by a foreign, foreign, foreign adversary or terrorist to prevent an imminent threat of death, serious bodily or economic harm, economic harm, a serious threat to a minor, serious violent crimes, crimes relating to fraud or identity threat, espionage and censorship, and protection of trade secrets. S234, the Rupenberger Bill, allows use for cyber crimes, protection from death or serious bodily injury, protection of minors from child porn, sexual exploitation, and threats to their physical safety, including kidnapping and trafficking, quite a list. The McCall Bill, which passed, additionally requires, I think this is good, that the DHS Inspector General, in consultation with PCLOB, 
periodically submit a report reviewing the use made of information shared with the DHS Center for purposes other than cyber protection. And that report would include the type of information shared, actions taken by the center based on that information, the impact on sharing on privacy, of privacy, on privacy and civil liberties, a list of the federal agency recipients of that other information and recommendations for improvements or modifications to improve information sharing. Privacy advocates, not unsurprisingly, have strenuously objected to the breadth of authorized uses apart from cyber crimes and crimes involving bodily harm to children. They also object to the inclusion of something called computer crimes, which appears in many of the bills, alleging that it would sweep too broadly and cover any crime that incidentally utilized a computer in its commission, suggesting a more stringent limit on use to crimes of which an element of the basic offense charge involves cyber threat conduct, as defined in the law itself. Now, PCLOB, again, has dealt, though not with unanimity, in its 702 report, with the permissibility of government use of information collected for one purpose and its subsequent use for another purpose. In 702, we grappled with the use of automatic queries of data banks utilizing US person indicators whose identity and PI had been incidentally disclosed in communications with FISA targeted entities captured and retained without any decision having made on their foreign intelligence values. Once retained in the FBI's FISA data bank, specially authorized personnel could access such data to screen ordinary criminal suspects. We were not unanimous in our recommendations. The chair and I parted company with our other colleagues in insisting that this unevaluated data of non-targeted persons should not, for both constitutional and policy reasons, be used for domestic crime screening purposes without specific authorization by a neutral magistrate. But a majority of the board suggested <clears throat> additional internal controls on the practice would be sufficient. Now, the circumstances surrounding use of cyber threat information might be different. It concerns information voluntarily given to the government, not compelled. But the issue of extended use of threat information to cover virtually all of the criminal code does deserve serious thought, if only for its potential deterrent effect on private entities who could refrain from reporting the critical information for fear subsequent disclosure would implicate their own or working colleagues in a long list of ordinary or complex white collar crimes involving trade secrets or economic and physical harm. Now, I've talked a long time, and I am about to conclude. I have only this last page. But before I go, I would be remiss if I didn't mention two of PCLOB's more general projects that have cybersecurity impact. The first is our mandate to keep the public informed of our work. And we have conducted a series of public forums devoted to the substantive issues on which we're working and the projects we're contemplating. We haven't done one yet on cybersecurity, but it's quite possible we would do so Colleagues agree, and PCLOB's activity in the field accelerates as a result of new legislation. The other area we're working on is review of the training protocols of the agencies, more specifically in this case, the training of cybersecurity personnel. For such important and precise work, in addition to the basic training given all employees in privacy and civil liberties, many think specialized training in recognizing and scrubbing unnecessary PI is required. It certainly seems probable that if the new information sharing legislation is enacted, the current training would profit from a second look. So to conclude, PCLOB's role in cybersecurity is still a work in progress, dependent on Congress and our own board's priority decisions. I personally believe, however, we do have an important role to play in combating one of our greatest threats to national security, but in a way that is consonant with our traditional protections for liberty and for privacy. And I thank you for listening so patiently to my reasons why. What, what is the time like? OK, I'll take a few questions the remaining time. So a few questions that Judge Walls will take. Are there any? Good. Way over there oh, on the end. Right. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, they're OK. Be patient. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, with the Snowden leaks, it uh, came out that the NSA was able to keep information for non-targeted U.S. citizens for five years if that information was unencrypted. If it was encrypted, that information could be kept 
indefinitely. Can you discuss um, the discussions and the logic that were allowed, that went about allowing for that uh, keeping of information if it was encrypted for non-targeted U.S. citizens indefinitely? I really can't, and the reason I can't isn't that I've, somebody has told me I can't. It's that I simply don't know enough about that. It's an air, as I say, we're just entering the cybersecurity era, and uh, I, I know about the debate. I've heard people talk about it. I do not know anything about the internal workings of the government that arrived at that rationale. Sorry. Other questions? Well, I have a question. Okay. I have a question about the 702s. About what? The 702s. Yes. Okay. So could you stay for a few more hours so that I could uh, talk no, to you? No, but I can give you our report. But I, but I dissented from part of it. So. <laughs> yeah, though that's the part I'm curious about. Can you tell us a little more about the dissent and the conversation? Well, the, the conversation was, and I, perhaps I referred to cryptically, was that um, when this incidental information which gets collected in 702s because a person, I'll use an extreme example, uh, you know, is the target is having uh, email communications with his first cousin or something like that. And it goes on and on. The first cousin has no idea that he's a target. And the first cousin, you know, is, there's no reason to believe that that first cousin, at least initially, has any terrorist. Uh, so under the minimization rules of the NSA, which are public, um, if, if a decision is made that, uh, that these incidental information about U.S. persons uh, are not of any intelligence value, then they should be purged. But, and it's in our report, it's just that that decision uh, doesn't get made. It's supposed to be made periodically, but it, in most cases, it does not get made, so it stays in the databanks. It does have, they, the, the rules provide for restrictions on use and dissemination. I don't suggest that they don't, but you know the analysts can go through, and then now they can use the U.S. person indicator if they want. So the law provides for no, what, what what we dissented on was, if you wanted to query that by querying, I mean, you use the identity of the U.S. person, and you say we want to use that identity to go through the data banks and see if, right. if there's a lot of other stuff there. Why not? And we said, two of us, the chair and I, said, no, no, that gets very close to a kind of search warrant type yeah. thing. And we thought, we didn't say constitutionally, but we thought that policy, and we did refer to a constitutional case would require that. Uh, our colleagues thought, no, they did call for additional restrictions, but they didn't say what they were. And so I don't know what they were either. I would call that a word of warning from the wise. Join me in thanking Judge okay. Walt. And we're going to go directly into our next panel, so hang on.